All right, so Luke chapter 18. And he, Jesus, spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Well, Heavenly Father, we do come to you now in Jesus' name, asking you to lead us and guide us and to teach us this morning, Lord, as we look into your word. You'll be our teacher, Lord, I pray. Help me as I try to share uh, what is on my heart and I believe what's on your heart. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. A good portion of this chapter is about prayer. Prayer is an important thing. Do you know you're more likely to find a a, uh, living man who does not breathe than to find a living Christian that does not pray. Now, is it very likely to find a living man that does not breathe? Not likely. It's even less likely that you would find a living Christian that does not pray. Prayer is the breath of the soul. Prayer is what Christians do. It's how we survive. It's how we live. Without prayer, you might as well just choke somebody. You might as well just prevent them from getting air into their lungs because you'll kill somebody if you if you keep the air away from them. In a spiritual sense, prayer is extremely important. In fact, it's vital. You must pray. Jesus spoke this first parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Okay, so we got it. What's the parable all about? The parable is to encourage you to pray. All right? God wants us to pray. Is prayer important? Yes, it's important. Is it important in my life, in your life? Yes, it's important. And how often do we pray? Three times a day? No. God wants us to always pray. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. To remain in an attitude of prayer. In an attitude of communion with God. Now, I talk a lot. Sorry, I do, and I know I do. I I talk a lot at home. I talk a lot to Carolyn when we're driving in the car. I just talk. I probably do more talking than she does. She does most of the listening. But she will, from time to time, talk back. And I will usually, when she does that, I'll say, wait, wait I'm not finished. <laughs> because I, I, I like to talk. But, you know, I have to tell you, has there ever been a time in your married life when you're not talking? Where it's silent and the silent treatment's going on? That's no good, Right. That's destruction for a marriage when the silent treatment comes. In a sense, you know things are right when you're just talk, talk, talking. You might be talking about important things or trivial things, but it's that communication, that line of communication that's so important that it stays open. And it needs to be open all the time. It needs to be open all the time. When you wake up in the morning, And I'm talking about a spouse. When you wake up in the morning, you need to be talking. You need to be communicating. When you go to bed at night, you need to be communicating throughout the day. 
You know, sometimes it's a whole lot easier for a husband and wife to communicate early in the morning and late at night. Sometimes, sometimes not, but sometimes it is. In the middle of the day, we get busy sometimes, but Jesus is saying to us that prayer is important all the time. Uh, the little song we would sing as kids, whisper a prayer in the morning, whisper a prayer at noon, whisper a prayer in the evening, will keep your heart in tune. Well, that's good. But the Bible goes beyond that and says we ought always to pray. And to give the parable, Jesus talks about a judge, a city judge, who did not fear God and he didn't regard men. Now, the people that write the commentaries have pointed out that this is probably not, Jesus is probably not referring to a Jewish judge. Because in those days, the Jewish uh, judges or judicial system would have been a council, would have been a, a, a group of people. But in this one, it's an individual man who is a judge. These were probably political judges, probably, appointed by Pontius Pilate or Herod, representing more the Roman government. And they were the ones that were uh, dispensing out judgment. And they were notoriously corrupt. They could be bought off. They were notoriously corrupt. Here, Jesus says, there was one of these judges. He didn't fear God. And he didn't regard men. He didn't care. But there was a widow who, who had been mistreated. All throughout the Bible, the Bible tells us that widows and orphans are God's special concern. He watches over them. And he will avenge them and protect them. You got to be careful if you're messing with widows or orphans because God is their protector and he will avenge them. So anyway, this is a poor widow and she's going to the judge because she wants to be avenged of her adversary. But this guy's got no time for her, probably because she doesn't have a bribe in her back pocket. He's that kind of a guy. He's a corrupt guy. But then it says here that because she was persistent, and she kept coming and knocking and saying, I, 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 I want to communicate with you. I want to get with you. I need your help in my life. Even this wicked man would give in and say, okay, okay. If I don't take care of this now, you're going to trouble me. And it's going to make my life miserable. And so, okay, I'll go ahead and give you what you want. Otherwise, you'll just weary me. Now, Jesus says, listen to what the unjust says. Now, is God an unjust judge? No. Is God, is, is this a comparison that Jesus is saying, or not a comparison, is Jesus saying that God is like this unjust judge? No, no, no. What he's doing is he's using it as a contrast. If an unjust judge will listen to somebody for unjust reasons and unjust causes, how much more is God going to be willing and wanting to hear uh, the prayers of those who are his special care? God especially cares for widows. Oh, I'll tell you what. God will take care of his own. He's not an unjust judge. He's a loving, kind judge who loves to have people come to him. And look at there in verse 7, it says, that cry to him day or night. And they bring the request to him. Let's think about this widow. Something's unfair in her life. Something has happened. Somebody's done her dirt. And God tells you, Jesus tells you, that he may bear long. He may not uh, answer in a time frame that we, we think he should, but he cares. He's not an unjust judge. But now look at what we read in verse number eight. And maybe you've, you've heard this verse, you've read this verse so many times in isolation, but in context, the context of being persistent in prayer 
I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Let me read the way Ken Taylor put it in the Living Bible. He said this. Yes, he will answer them quickly. But the question is, when the Messiah returns, how many will he find who have faith and are praying? The kind of faith that prays. That seems to be where it's concluding because it's related to that story. Will he find faith? Not just nebulous. How many will he find that are still praying? How many will he find when Jesus returns? How many people will he find that are still crying out to him, still seeking, still knocking, still seeking, still praying? Prayer is important. Remember, the parable is told so that men might always pray. God wants you and me to pray. So that's the first part of this chapter. Now the second part of this chapter goes to how the prayer looks. And this is church prayer now. And he spoke this parable unto certain, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Okay, so now Jesus turns and he's going to talk to people who trust in their own righteousness and despise other people. In other words, they think they're better than everybody else. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. Now, before I keep going there, just hang with me for a second, but I want you to keep track of this. Remember, in this first parable, he's talking about a corrupt government official. Well, what were publicans? Corrupt government officials. So he follows the, the thing, first one about prayer with another one about prayer, but it's interesting because the corrupt government official in this one turns out to be the good guy. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He prayed with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So we start with an admonition to pray all the time. And now we go to a story that tells us how to pray. We pray in humility, right? And we, don't, we pray to God, not to ourselves. That Pharisee, he stood where everybody could, he was praying to himself. He, he wanted, it was all about him. Listen to me pray. Listen, listen I, I, don't, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do that, I do this and I do that. I, here's all the good things I do, here's all the bad things I don't do. And hey, I even fast twice in the, in the week. Now, don't look at me and say, you need to be fasting twice a week, Dave. I do. I, I know I do. But you know what? This is a significant thing. Uh, I don't know very many. I, I admit to you, maybe I should be fasting twice a week. But the only thing I do fast is I eat fast. <laughs> That's about it. Shame on me for that. He gives tithes. This is a good thing. These are good things that he's doing. But he's, he's, he's putting himself in the position where people can see him as he prays. And he makes sure that in his prayers, he touts himself. See, because this is all about him. It's all about being seen of men, being heard of men. And he's not worried about being heard from God. You see, because if it was about being heard by God, he could go in his closet at home, close the door, and the father that hears in secret would reward him openly. But it's not about communicating with God. This hypocrite is on a religious stage, and he's performing a religious act. 
An act is when you try to pretend that you are one person when you are not. You're really somebody else. You're an impersonator. You remember Rich Little, how he could impersonate everybody? That's what a religious hypocrite is. He's an impersonator. He's impersonating somebody. True religion and undefiled is in, before God is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep yourself um, uh, unspotted from the world. You know, if you're a real Christian, you, you care about other people, especially the widows, especially them. Well, anyway, the publican, though. Now, this is the guy that should, should be the bad guy in the film or in the, in the story in the film. But the publican standing afar off, he didn't want to get in the middle of the church. He didn't want to stand up where everybody else could hear him. He wanted to get alone in the back of the church, bow his head, and he cried out to God. And he smote on his breast. He didn't even lift up his head. He didn't want anybody to hear him. He was crying out to God. He couldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know what? When Carolyn tells me that she loves me, I like that. But I want her to look at me when she tells me that. <laughs> I don't want her to go like this. Yeah, I love you. I love you. Hey, I'm over here. I'm over here. Over here. Look at me. Look at me. I don't want to look at you. <laughs> look at me and tell me that. This man couldn't even look to heaven. He just cried out to God. This is humility. God being merciful to me, a sinner. Here's how Ken Taylor translated that. But the corrupt tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. But he beat upon his chest in sorrow, exclaiming, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Some have pointed out that it could be translated, the sinner. The sinner. He wasn't looking at anybody else. The Pharisee was looking at everybody else. Hey, I'm better than that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. The publican, though, he was only looking at himself. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said he was the one that went home uh, justified. And uh, not the other. And then Jesus tells us, <laughs> those who try to exalt themselves are going to be brought down low. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. So. Pray all the time. That's the first part of the chapter. The second is pray in humility and pray to God, not to men. All right, but now look at the next prayer because this chapter uh, talks a lot about prayer. Verse 15. And they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. That means that he would pray for them and bless them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Now, how is this? There's people that are supposedly, look, these are the apostles. There are people that want to come and be blessed by Jesus. And there's people that want their loved ones to come and be blessed by Jesus. How can the disciples get in the way of this? How can the disciples be the very ones that prevent the little ones from coming to Jesus? Jesus is not happy with what his disciples are doing. And he doesn't want us to uh, do that. When Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, he is saying, hey, don't prevent these kids from coming to me. But even more than that, you go get them and bring them to me. You go get them. Um, amazing. 
One day, I'm reading Ken Taylor now, one day some mothers brought their babies to him to touch and bless, but the disciples told them, go away. And Jesus called the children over to him and said to the disciples, let the little children come to me and never send them away. For the kingdom of God belongs to men who have hearts as trusting as these little children's. And anyone who doesn't have their kind of faith will never get within the kingdom's gates. So we pray continuously. We pray with humility. We pray to God, not to be seen of men. And we pray for others, especially those that are weaker than us or those that we have responsibility over. And we bring them to Jesus for Jesus to bless them. Let me ask you this. You want your, do you want the people you know blessed by Jesus? Yeah. How about your family? You want them, the, the lesser ones in your neighborhood? Or, you want them? Yeah. Okay, well, Jesus says, don't do things that will prevent them from coming. In fact, you go get them and bring them to me. So we need to be involved in that. That's a part of prayer too, you know? Jesus wants to bless others, not just us. Oh God, help us that we don't end up being, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord. And it's all about me being blessed. We ought to be able to have a heart that says, Lord, bless the little ones around me. All right, now it takes a little bit of a, a turn. Verse 18, and a certain ruler asked him saying, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? Not as good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother. And he said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the uh, kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto him, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. This is an interesting portion. Does it relate into prayer? I think it does in a certain way. First of all, Jesus is addressed as good master, and uh, that's important to keep in mind. God is good. And when we think about coming to him in prayer, we need to think about coming uh, uh, to a good God. But this man wanted to justify himself. And so he wanted to know uh, what he needed to do to be right with God. And basically, Jesus says, total commitment, baby. Total commitment. You got to give it all. <laughs> You got to give it all. If you think Christianity is anything other than 100% commitment, then you're mistaken. To follow Jesus, you have to give all. It's just like a woman getting married at the altar. She gives all. She doesn't give 90%. She gives all. And the husband gives all. And they become one. That's what it is uh, to be a Christian. Now, Peter says, well, hey, we did that. And Jesus said, yeah, you did. You did. Uh, but you're not going to lack anything here, and you're not going to lack, lack anything in the world to come. You made the right decision. And uh, he kind of leaves it there. Now in verse 31, Jesus turns toward the cross. Then he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Now, isn't that strange? It seems like it's pretty clear. But they didn't get it. They were clueless. 
And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, now look another uh, in the midst of this, now another miracle. A certain blind man sat by the way begging, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and he commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, what wilt thou that I do, uh, shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, receive thy sight, thy faith has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Now, this is this is where I think we can wrap it up. And uh, I won't belabor the point anymore. I said most of this chapter is about prayer. And I think that prayer goes all the way through here. Jesus is getting ready to die on the cross. And he knows it. He tells his disciples, okay. Total commitment, you have to make total commitment. And now I'm heading to Jerusalem because I've made total commitment to the Father and I'm going to obey him. And, and this, is, this is going to turn out where they kill me. And, uh, but the third day I'll rise again. His disciples are clueless. But you see, that's still on his mind. Remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed uh, and, and sweat, well, uh, blood came down. He was in agony as he prayed in the Garden. So this was heavy on him. And yet, what does he do? He's coming through Jericho, and here's all the blind beggar who comes to Jesus humbly and says, um, will, you, will you heal me? Will you touch my need? Now, I don't know about you, Jerry, but between being blind or being killed on a cross, I think probably choose blindness. <laughs> uh, Jesus was heading for something uh, hard in his life. And yet, he had time for somebody else's needs. This is the heart of God, that we are a priority to him. Yes, the Lord is doing a lot of things in the world, and yes, Jesus was heading to the cross, but he took time out from his important work, the reason he came he took time out to take care of the needs of one man, one poor blind beggar. Now, the good thing about this story is, is when I think about it, I think of God with all of his, all that he has to do. He has to keep the world running and the planets going and the, uh, the rain falling and all that he has to do. And he cares for all the people in the world and uh, he's, the gospel is going out, all the important things that God is doing. Yet, God still has time for me, for an individual. He still cares about me. Notice the persistence of this blind man. The disciples came and said, ah, don't bring those kids here. But the parents persisted. They continued. The blind man said, Jesus, heal me. And the disciples tried to keep him away, but he persisted. He wouldn't quit. It says that he should hold his peace. They wanted to do that. But the more they told him, hold your peace, the more he cried out to Jesus. Jesus cares about us. We are important to him and all of our needs are important to him. We need to pray to him continually. Come to him continually because he has the power to take care of all of our needs. He has the power and he's not too busy <clears throat> to listen to your prayers. I close with a little song that I wrote years ago. God speaks every language in the world. He understands every word that's spoken. And God is not too busy to listen to our prayers. He can hear us when we're calling out to him. God is not too busy. God is not too busy. God is not too busy to listen to our prayers. He can hear us calling. He can hear us calling. He can hear us calling out to him.
God cares and he is loving and we should pray to him and we should pray always. Father, we thank you for your word and we ask you now, Lord, to take this chapter and sink it deep down into our hearts, Lord. Help us to understand. And Lord, we just thank you that you are there and that we can come to you and we can pray to you. Help us to come humbly. Help us to come consistently. Help us to not prevent others, but help us to even bring others to you. And then, Lord, uh, even in the midst of all of your doings in this world, remember us, Lord. Remember us and touch us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.